All right, good morning. All right, welcome to a new week. How's everyone doing? Good? Okay. All right, shall we just begin with the word of prayer and then we'll begin with our session. Father, we thank you for yet another new week that you have added into our lives. Lord, we thank you for your goodness, for your mercies that are new every morning, oh God. And even as we Lord, come together to study and learn. Oh God, I pray, Holy Spirit, you will minister to us, you will speak to us, that our hearts will be a good ground, oh God, to receive your word. And, and Lord, everything that we learn will bear fruit in our lives, oh God. Thank you for calling us to be partakers of your kingdom, to build your kingdom, Lord. We, we pray, God, that you will, uh, Lord, continue to strengthen us, equip us, empower us by your Holy Spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So it's been a couple of, uh, it's been a long time since we, uh, you know, we, we missed a couple of classes for lifestyle evangelism. So let me just do a quick review of what we did the last class. Last class, uh, you have your notes? All of you have your notes? It's, you have it, okay. So we did chapter five last class, right? And uh, we did chapter five, yes? Yes, we did chapter five, right? We looked at uh, asking questions, right? Uh, asking leading questions. When you and I are ministering to people, when we get opportunities to share the gospel, we must ask good questions, leading questions, meaning don't ask random questions. Which is your favorite color? That's not a, that's a random question. Right? Ask leading questions. Right? So what did Jesus do? Nine out of ten times when people asked Jesus a question, he responded back with a question. Right? So we must learn to develop the ability to ask the right questions. Right? So when we ask questions, we try to understand what the person is thinking. We try to understand what he's assuming. Right? So, for example, if you ask a, a, a person maybe from another faith, uh, uh, an unbeliever, if you ask them, what do you think about church? So when they respond, we get to know, okay, this is what they think about church. But the story will be completely different to what the reality is of church. Right? So we saw that we must ask leading questions, good questions, so that the conversation goes on well. Get to know their belief system. When you are ministering to a person, get to know what they believe in. Now, just because they have a Hindu name or a Muslim name doesn't mean they are that. They can be atheists. They don't believe in God. Right? So don't come to conclusions. Ask the right questions. Right? Get to know their belief system. The second approach is the prayer approach. Now, this happens most of the time when people will come up to you and say, hey, you know, this is the problem that I'm going through. I've been searching for a job, no job. My family, people are unwell. You know, there's an illness. My mother is not well admitted at the hospital. So it gives you and I an opportunity to pray, the prayer approach, right? And not always people will come and share their thoughts or their challenges. But as you discuss with them, you, it gives you an opportunity to pray. Right? And now when you pray, it's very important to, you know, don't, don't feel in your mind, what will he think? Or what will she think if I pray in Jesus' name? What if they make fun of me? Don't worry about all that. Remember chapter 1? The message of God is the power of God unto salvation. Right? So our prayer and the, and, the, and the message, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God. It's not about our power. Do we have power? Not really. It's only the anointing of God upon our lives, the word of God, which brings forth power. Right? Then we looked at the testimony approach. Give your brief testimony, two minute testimony, what you needed, how God came through, how God provided for you, and how He changed your life. Now, especially when you're sharing the gospel don't share for one hour hey I'll, I'll tell you my testimony sit down you know, when i was born i was going to die in the stomach 
after i was born still i was going to die then uh, everyone lost hope don't need to tell the whole story you got to be quick right uh, you just have maybe 10 or 15 minutes with that person or even if it's 5 minutes that 5 minutes must be a meaningful conversation so that when he he or she goes back home they should think oh what he said is interesting because if you say 100 things they'll be thinking oh i've just wasted 10 minutes of my time speaking to that fellow right so know what to speak right two minute testimony then the power encounter approach which is healing word of knowledge prophecy uh praying for uh, you know a supernatural work of god to happen and even as we do all of this we looked at rules of engagement right well in in page 18 how to engage jo show genuine love and care don't be judgmental avoid arguments it's very easy to get into an argument hey jesus is better than your god right or you know he you know what jesus did he walked on water what did you do nothing right now it becomes an argument right so get away from arguments um and don't let people's negative response bring you down which means not everyone will say oh very good job thank you for sharing jesus now people will make fun people will bring you down they will their negative responses will be there but don't let that pull you down continue to do what god has called you to do okay let's get into chapter 6 chapter 6 talks about invite and pray and everyone say invite and pray so we talked about how to minister we must also invite people not only to church not only for events but invite them to accept the lord jesus christ give them an opportunity and pray for them okay so this this session we'll just look at a few points here and how do we invite people right the number one way or the number one method of inviting people is based on trust right so for example if if i say uh you know if i have a good friend he's he knows me for many years i say hey you wait for me in this place at 10 o'clock in the morning i will come there right most likely he will be there why because he trusts me Yes or no? Yes, he trusts. Right? Now, you and I, when we are ministering to people, we must build trust. Trust doesn't happen immediately. Does it happen immediately? Trust is built. Even trust can be broken, but it can be built again. Yes. How many of you have friends that you didn't trust, but then after that you trust hundred percent? He'll give his life for me. Right? we have those people right you, you just trust them you know he will do it or she will do it they are there for me right now the number one way of ministering to people is based on trust when a person trusts you they will trust what you speak they will trust what you say they will trust what you believe right so let's look at this example john chapter 1 was 35 through 39 four verses john 1 35 to 39 let's read it anyone can read it please john chapter 1 35 to 39 the next day john was there again with two of his disciples when he saw jesus passing by he say look the lamb of god When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, "What do you want?" They say, "Rabbi," which means teacher. Oh, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Yes. See now, let me just paint a picture for you. Just think about this, right? 
John the Baptist has come. He's baptizing people. And hundreds of people are coming to the river Jordan to be baptized. Now, John the Baptist has a few disciples. Right? So John the Baptist is going to one place. He has two disciples with him at that moment. He's going and he sees Jesus. And John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. See, he's the one. Then Andrew and the disciple says, So he's the Lamb of God. Can we go there? And, and what did... What did John say? He said, go. So if we go on to the uh, and that passage that we read, Andrew goes to Jesus. And what, it does, what does he ask Jesus? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one in, we've, that is you know, written about in the Old Testament? Are you, is that what Andrew asks? What does Andrew ask? Read that. What does it say? It says, Andrew asks Jesus. Saying? Where do you stay? Interesting question, no? John the Baptist has two of his disciples there and says, go, for, go. he's the Lamb of God, you go. For, he, he's the one who will, is the Messiah. Now, Andrew and the other disciple goes to Jesus and asks, where do you stay? Jesus says, come. Now, Jesus also was very clever, no? Is wisdom. Jesus didn't act like Google Maps. Go straight, take a left, you'll find one house there, take the right. You know. No. He said, come and see. Simple. Come and see. Andrew came. They sat with Jesus the whole day, and when they stepped out of the house, they believed that Jesus is the Messiah. But it all started with John the Baptist. <laughs> Because Andrew and the other disciple, they trusted John the Baptist. Hey, John is saying that he's the Messiah. There may have been questions in the mind. They may not have believed it. Said, but John is saying. So John has done great works. If he's saying, then there's something about this person. And John doesn't say, look, the, uh, uh, you know, the... Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, but you go, don't go now, come go later. After I die, then you go. No, he says, go. Right? Based on trust. When you and I minister to people, if there is some kind of trust built, right? Uh, so maybe your friends or people that you know, maybe people who are Christians or unbelievers, and there's a trust, and when you share to them, you talk about Jesus. You talk about how God changed your life. Even if they don't believe it, they will trust you. And because they trust you, they will begin to believe it. They will at least try it. Right? So if, you, if, if there's somebody who says, you know what, I have, I'm always feeling unwell. This body pain, physical illness, always. Now, he or she may be a very good friend. What can you say? Hey, I pray to Jesus, and whenever I pray, even I have weaknesses, even I feel, you know, my body pains, and I go through all this, but when I pray to Jesus, there's some kind of a strength, and I get strengthened, and I feel like, you know, I go back and do everything that I have to do. Now, this person may not believe in Jesus, but they believe what you say, so they will try it out. You get what I'm saying, right? Now, if I tell you, I will finish this class at 8.50. Sorry, 9.50. 9 to 9.50 is this class. You trust me, right? Or if I say, hey, tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to come. I'm going to talk to all of you. There's a certain trust that is built here. So I said he'll come, so he'll come. The same way, when you build trust, when you speak into people's lives, they will receive it, right? Why do, when you look at a church, uh, why do church members, uh, congregation, they come and they share their most intimate secrets, which nobody knows. Sometimes even their own family members don't know. But they'll come and share with the pastor. 
Have you ever thought of that? Right? Don't tell anybody. My husband doesn't know. My wife doesn't know. Or my children don't know. The children or the youth come and say, "Hey, my parents don't know." But pastor, can you keep it to yourself? Why do they do that? Because they believe they, there's some kind of a trust, right? So the moment you build trust, you'll be able to minister to people. And that's what happened here. Because there was trust that was developed with John and the disciples, John was able to tell the disciples, go to Jesus. And they believed in him. They believed it, right? They readily accepted what John the Baptist said, and they went with Jesus. Now let's look at the second uh, portion. First one is based on trust. Second one, the same chapter, verse 40 and 42. John 1, 40 and 42. Yes, go ahead. Can I read, Pastor? Yes, please go ahead. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated stone. Yes. So look at the look at the sequence of events first john the baptist has his disciples he says the lamp of god jesus is there and what do they do andrew goes andrew goes meets with jesus whole day he's been with jesus and he says oh he's really the messiah now what does andrew do first thing i have to go find my brother goes and finds simon peter right he goes he finds simon peter tells him what hey you know what um, uh, you know i was very busy today i was doing a lot of things does he say all that no straight he goes to simon peter and says peter we have found the messiah so the second way of sharing right uh, the gospel is by sharing based on common interest now the jews were waiting for the messiah Right? Andrew was a Jew, Simon was uh, Peter was a Jew. They're waiting for the Messiah. What does Andrew say? Andrew goes to Peter and says, Peter, we have found the Messiah. And what does Andrew do? He takes Peter to Jesus. This is called the power of a single invitation. Did Andrew think what Peter would become? Did Andrew think what Peter would become? He said, Andrew saying, I went and I saw Jesus. I spoke to him. He is the Messiah. Goes, he says, Peter, Peter, you also come. You see what, what is happening here. This is the Messiah. And Peter says, from now on, you will be called Peter. Cephas, the, the rock is what you will be called. The power of a single invitation. When you and I share the gospel, Right, and who we are ministering to, we never know what they can do for the kingdom of God. Peter went on to become the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He became the founding fathers of Christianity because of single invite. What did Andrew say? We found the Messiah. Come and see. You get what I'm saying, right? Let me share this uh, story that I read. Everyone know Billy Graham? Everyone know Billy Graham? Evangelist Billy Graham, right? The great man of God who preached thousands and thousands of sermons and millions of people have come to Christ through his ministry, right? But very few of them know the background of his story. There was an, as he was growing up as a little boy, he grew up in the you know, countryside, which is more like villages, right? There was a small church. And in that church, there was an old man, right? And this old man would take Sunday school, right? So there would be about four or five children there. 
and he would take Sunday school. Very diligently, he would take Sunday school. Right? Uh, and people would ask him, you're so old. You know, you're going through your own challenges. Why do you want to struggle? Why do you want to, you know, these children are not even listening to you. They're running all over the place. And you are, you know, every Sunday you're here. But they encouraged him. I, he was an old man. He would come, he would teach these children. And after a lot of effort of teaching and teaching and teaching, at old age, he passed away. But one of those boys turned out to be Billy Graham. Did he know that he's going to minister to a boy who's going to be the greatest evangelist of the world has ever seen after Jesus? Right? So you never know. It could be your neighbor. It could be a friend you know. You share the gospel with him. You never know. Next thing, 10 years down the line, God is using him or her so powerfully. And you feel, thank God I shared about Jesus to him. Yes or no? Right. So you, here's the thing. We never must look at a person and think, oh, he can't do anything. Or she can't do anything. No, no, no. Right? Peter didn't, John, Jesus didn't look at Peter and say, you're a fisherman. No. Jesus looked at Peter and said, you're the leader of the church. You'll be the rock. You'll be a strong foundation. Right? So based on common needs, Andrew was convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. He goes, finds his brother, Simon Peter. Simon Peter knows uh, he's interested to know who is this Messiah. He goes and he meets Jesus. Andrew shared with Simon based on common interest. Now, what are the common interests that we may have? It could be music. It could be singing. It could be business. You know, some of us, it could be a sport. Right? So, for example, you know, you're playing cricket with your friends. And you know this boy, you know, he likes cricket. So that's a common interest. How will you minister to somebody, you know, you're, in, you're just playing cricket with 10 of you near the grounds, near your house. How will you minister? How, will you, how, how can you minister to a person? You know that they like cricket. Very simple. You just talk about cricket first. Right? Or if it's football, talk about football. Hey, you know, I was so tired, but, you know, I, I didn't have any energy. But I just prayed and I said, God, give me some strength. That's why I was able to play. Thank God for strength. Thank God that I have these hands and legs that I could play. So which God are you talking about? Door is open. What's happening? You're making, you're opening up an opportunity. Right? Based on common interest. Okay. Extending an invitation to those who are doubtful. Let's go on to read that, right? Verse 43 to 51. Those who are doubtful. You know what is the meaning of doubtful? That means, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't think I can believe in this. That's being doubtful. I don't think I can do well. It's not a yes, it's not a no. It's sitting on the fence. So let's read that passage. Same, word, same chapter, 43 to 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip, Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Beth Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, He have found him of whom Moses, Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said to him, 
Behold, an Israel is indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I say to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will be see greater things than this. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and yeah, we'll, the we'll stop of there. The yeah, we'll stop there. We'll stop there. Okay, now what's happening here? Right? Philip has met with Jesus. And Philip goes and finds his friend Nathaniel. Okay, so it's very interesting. Philip goes, finds his friend Nathaniel, and tells Nathaniel, Nathaniel, we have found the Messiah. Right? Now, Nathaniel, uh, sorry, Philip tells Nathaniel, Nathaniel, we've found the Messiah. Philip does not try to attempt to convince, you know, you have to believe. You have to believe. Right? This is what he did. This is what he said. No, he didn't convince Nathaniel. He said three words. What did he say? Come and see. Everyone say, come. Sometimes when you and I are ministering to people, we don't have to convince them about the Bible, convince them about the cross. Please come and sit. Only if you come to the church, you don't have to do all of that. Right? You just have to say, come and see. You come and see. That's what Philip did. So what did Nathaniel say? Okay, let me come and see who's this Messiah that you're talking about. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Who's this Messiah? So Nathaniel comes. And Nathaniel sees Jesus. I can just picture what's in his mind. He's the Messiah. He's the one we are praying for. Though. And then, what does Jesus say? Through the word of knowledge, Jesus reveals to them. Reveals to Nathaniel who he is. Look, there's an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. That means he's a he's a holy man. And I saw you sitting, standing under the fig tree. Then Nathaniel believes that he's the Messiah. But what did what did it all start with? Philip. What did he say? Come and see. That's all. Nathaniel came. The Lord Jesus spoke the word of knowledge and he believed that Jesus was the Messiah. So come and see is an everyday situation that we can use. Come and see. I remember we were in Mangalore uh, and the church was still growing in APC Bangalore. And Mangalore was known for its youth. right? People would come from different cities, different nations to come and study in Mangalore. So I saw this whole community of, there was the African community, the Northeast community, and many, many students were there, right? So I remember telling one of our youth, I said, what is it that, you know, we were just discussing, what is it that can get the youth to come? Uh, you know, what, what can we do? So as we were praying, thinking about it, I came up, we, we all, we all came up with us, with an idea, a thought, said, let's play a movie. And the name of the movie is um, Facing the Giants. It's a Christian movie about a sport. Uh, you know, it's American football, about a sport and how God helped this team, which was, you know, on it was a very bad team, losing in all the matches, a losing team to becoming a winning team, right? Uh, it's called Facing the Giants. I said, okay, we'll do that. So we began to... Uh, you know, make these small invitations, movie night for youth, uh, Christian movie night for youth, come. And we made some passes and we gave it to all our youth in church. And they went and shared it with people. Right? 
And so that evening, I think it was about 5 p.m. in the evening on a Saturday, uh, they came. A few of them came. New people came. I knew youth, uh, youths from different colleges. They all came. And we played the movie, right? After the whole movie, I just came front. I shared a word. Now, among that team of new people was a young man, young boy, a student. And he said, no, Pastor, uh, we have just moved to this city. I have a lot of friends. So can I bring them tomorrow to church? Right? They said, OK. I said, OK, yeah, you can bring them. He brought 15 people to church. Right? 15 people. All 15 friends came and sat. Right? Now, that time, our church was only about maybe 15 people. Right? We were just trying to build the church. We were 15 people. Maybe 10 families, 10 of them are couples, and five youth. Now, all of a sudden, 15 youth have come. Now, the church has become 30 people. And those 15 people started inviting others. We started doing youth meetings. What did they do? Hey, come to church. No, come and see. They, we never made any invitations. Nothing. Come and see. So they started inviting. In maybe eight months, it was 65 people in church. What was 10? It was all about come and see. They came to church. They saw the service, attended the worship, saw the service. I didn't say, you know, we did our call, you know, hey, thank you for coming. Uh, hope to see you next week. That's it. They started coming. And they themselves started inviting others. People started coming. And in about one and a half years, we were almost 90, 85, 90 people in church. How? Come and? Say those three words. Come. Say, it, say all three words. That's it. Then what happened was, there was this African community. I met two boys. And I said, hey, we have a church here. Why don't you? Why don't you? So they said, OK, we'll come. They came on Sunday. They, they, they said, oh, it's nice. They went and invited their friends. So in one, we had Northeast people. We had Africans. We had families. Our church was a mixed church. And because of that, a lot of people in our church were very open. Right? It was very, everyone were open with each other. We cared for each other. There was so much of unity in the church. Right? There was no division. There was, it was beautiful, wonderful church. Very strong church we came. Right? How? Come and see. So there will be times you will get the opportunity. And all you have to do is say, come and see. It can be an invitation to a cell group. Hey, come and see. Right? Realize the power of a single invitation. Andrew went and found Andrew found Jesus. He went and found Peter. And here Philip goes and finds Nathaniel. Right? Think of various situations through which that people are going through, which provides an opportunity that you and I can invite them to explore Jesus. They are facing challenges in life. People are facing questions. People are interested. People are disinterested. People are thankful for the good things. People are open to receiving things. Right? So there are so much, so many situations that we see around us. None of us can say, it doesn't matter which faith, none of them can say, I, I'm OK, don't worry about me. No. Nobody can say that. Right? Uh, if you look at what's happening around us, Life is so uncertain, right? so uncertain. We don't know what is happening. Right? Recently, I read in the news, I think it was recently I saw that somewhere, where, where this, this young boy was riding the bike. He lost balance. He fell. And when he fell down, just the edge of his head hit the footpath. It was a simple fall, the edge of his head. 
it cracked open, he started bleeding, and he passed away. He was not going 100, 120, he was going a small, because of the wet road, he just slipped and fell. You see, life is so uncertain, right? People need Jesus. People need a savior, right? And so when we share the gospel, it gives them an opportunity to invite them, right? And if you look at church, right, uh, most of us will know, you know, every church will have a church event, right? Most of you all have church events, right? Do you have youth meeting, women's ministry, children's church? All of that is there in your churches? Yes? So invite people. Right? Hey, why don't you come and see? Right? Uh, now, I know the setting is different here in urban setting. Some of you may be in a rural setting, in towns. and uh, But still, it's the same gospel. It's the same. That doesn't change. So you invite them. Let God minister to them. You say, come and see. That's it. Right? Uh, now, what holds us back to not invite people to church? Okay. By show of hands, tell me how many of you have invited your friends or people from other faiths to church? How many of you have invited? One, two, only two of you, three. Did you understand the question? Right? How many of you have invited? people from other faith, Hindu or Muslim or Buddhist, you have invited them to church. How many? One, lift your hand up now. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, very good. Okay. So most of us have done it. But there are times that, you know, things that stop us from inviting people. And we look at what are those things. One. Sometimes we are too self-conscious, and so we don't invite people. Self-conscious means, uh, you know, we feel that we are, what will they think about us, right? Or, or I'm not experienced enough, or I have my own personal challenges. I'm only going through sickness. How can I tell others about Jesus? We feel too conscious. Right? So we must avoid that, overcome that. Right? We all, you're not inviting people to, you know, to come and meet with you. You're inviting people to come and meet with Jesus. We will continue to have problems, challenges, difficulties, good times, bad times. All of that will be there. Sickness, healing, everything will be there. Right? But you're not inviting people to yourself. You're inviting people to come to Jesus. So we must remove that hindrance from our mind, right? Second one, they're afraid for rejection. Oh, what if they say no? If they say no, no, there's nothing to be afraid of it. Say, no, I'm not coming to your church. I don't want to come to church. I'm not comfortable. That's OK. Move on, right? Third reason, sometimes we are afraid that others may perceive us differently. They may think that, oh, what is this fellow calling calling us to church? So that is why it is important not to compartmentalize our life, meaning Monday to Friday, I will be somebody else. Saturday, I will be somebody else. Sunday, I'll be somebody else. We must never do that. Right? Imagine a friend. Monday to Friday, you're using bad words with your friends. OK. Saturday, you don't meet him. But on Sunday morning, you say, thank you, Jesus. Your presence is all we need. Now, this friend, you have invited him to church, and he'll say, hey, Monday to Friday, we're doing everything wrong. Oh, you're using, we are using bad words. We are doing everything wrong. I am joining with you. A Sunday morning, you're going on the stage and saying, thank you, Jesus. What is wrong now? Two faces. That is why it's be the same person. Monday to Friday, if you are somebody who is who shows that you are alive, you belong to Jesus, Sunday morning they won't be surprised. Yes or no? Right? So don't compartmentalize your life. That way, you know your true friends will stay. Those who have to go will move on. See, this friends forever and all is never going to be there. Right? It doesn't make sense. There's no friends forever. 
that's all infatuations meaning it's all ideas and thoughts now right so you need to get over that don't worry about what people think of you you may be good in speaking bad in speaking believe in jesus go to church on sundays go for prayer meetings go for bible study what do my friends think hey why are you not coming to play i'm going for bible study hey why are you not coming to play i'm going for youth meeting but instead of youth meeting you say no i have to go visit my family what happens you're compartmentalizing your life tell them hey i'm going to church are you ashamed to go to church are you ashamed to go say hey, i'm going for youth meeting if you're ashamed then go back to god ask god for boldness ask god for courage and stand for your faith so that you don't have to make your you know you don't have to have two three faces one face and sometimes we do that and it's very wrong it's very sad as believers the sunday morning we'll get up we'll search for the mask there's my sunday mask and then we'll wear that mask praise the lord praise the lord everybody jai masih ki the lord is good all the time and all the time god is good you know, we come up with all these things but monday to friday oh, yeah. no 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 it is it is of no use we can we can't fool people we can fool people and that too you can't fool people all the time we can't fool jesus jesus will not say anything but he's not pleased when we do that be who you are you know when i was an unbeliever i made sure everyone knew my life showed it you going to church no way when i became a believer i made sure everyone knew i'm a believer so i started telling everyone about jesus so you either have to be there or be here which one do you have to choose where you want to be or you want to sit on the fence because if we sit on the fence what does the bible say in revelations if you are lukewarm God will not be pleased, right? And all of that. Right? So you have to choose. Lord, I'll stand for you. So it's not a Monday to Friday; it's a Monday to Sunday, every day, for Jesus. Yes, every moment. Right? It's not like okay, morning to afternoon is Bible class. After Bible class, I am free. No. Bible college will come and go. Your sessions will come and go. but who you are you must always remember that but right? don't don't be in a place of wavering in that area right sometimes people ask a lot of questions or they and we don't have the answers so we don't want to invite them we don't want to share about jesus now remember we don't have to know all the answers do we know all the answers not really but even if you don't know it's okay you can say hey i don't know about this i'll find out i'll let you know it's not like we are trying to solve all their problems we cannot right we're just inviting them to jesus right three important things when you're inviting people to uh, the church be simple everyone say be simple and be simple don't say hey why don't you come to my church in my church there is a uh, two db speakers three monitors uh then we have a bass guitarist we have electric guitar and the so nice it is led lightings are there everywhere why don't you come no be simple not only in what you say in your words also be simple there's beauty in simplicity right jesus was a simple man but even though in that simple way simple nature people followed him did you ever think of it why thousands of people are following this simple man because there's power there's beauty in simplicity be simple right two be truthful don't cover up by saying it's a it's you know now this happened many years ago there are times when some churches say uh, we have a concert what concert concert music concert no we need to tell them yes it's a music concert from 
a church. We're going to be singing gospel songs. Now, one of the things that we do is usually during Christmas, right? we get into these malls, apartment complexes. They give us opportunities, and we sing carols. Right? So many times they ask, what are this? What is seen? They don't know. They only know jingle bells. They don't know anything else. So they ask, what is it you're going to sing about? We tell them, we're going to sing about Jesus. Jesus in the Bible, about his birth. And we will talk about Jesus. We tell them openly. If they allow, good. If they don't allow, it's OK. But we are being truthful. So it's not like we are talking about Jesus. They come and tell us, hey, how can you talk about Jesus? No. Being truthful. Right? Um, so everywhere we go, we tell them, it's Christian ministry. We talk about Jesus. We believe in Jesus. That's our faith. Right? When we enter colleges, when we're ministering to college students, we tell them, we're talking about Jesus. They're not hiding anything. Right? Thirdly, be inviting without correcting. Right? So that means you're just saying, hey, would you like to come to church this Sunday? Would you like to come for the youth meeting? Would you like to join my cell group? Why don't you come and you know just watch us? Right? Or we have a youth meeting or a youth camp, church camp. Why don't you come? That's all you're doing, inviting them. Right? Give them the opportunity to explore and to find Jesus. Right? John 16, 8 says, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So let the Holy Spirit speak to their hearts. When you invite people, you pray for them and say, Holy Spirit, you speak to their hearts. John 16, 8, he is the Holy Spirit. When he comes, he will convict people of sin, righteousness, and just judgment. Right? So I'll let the Holy Spirit do the work. Don't be sitting next to that person, AC, hey, he's telling about Jesus. So this is actually what, no. Let the Holy Spirit convict. And after that, if they believe in Jesus, or even after the service, you can talk to them, ask them what they understood, what they didn't understand. That's a follow-up. But let the Holy Spirit do the work. You don't take on the role of the Holy Spirit. You've done the role of inviting to church. Let God minister. Right? After their first visit, help them to understand what they saw, right? uh, what, they, what they heard, what they experienced in the church. OK, this is worship. We're singing songs to God. The word is what, what it's the word of God. That is what we learn. That's what we obey. Help them to understand that. Right? Two, help them to connect with the church community. Right now, if they are OK, they can come back to the same church. But there are many times we've shared the gospel, but they are not, uh, you know, they, they feel they want a church which is smaller or to be a church which is. Uh, which has a, speaks a different language, connect them to a church community. Help people to get connected. Three, continue to invite them. And if they have made the decision to follow Jesus, then you disciple them. You talk about water baptism. You talk about the importance of uh, prayer, reading the Bible, the daily practices. And then you help them to a certain way, to a certain level. And then when you help them, at a, at a one point, you can release them into the things of God. OK, so they've come to a place. Right? Now, never feel that, hey, I brought this person to Jesus, so he must follow me the rest of my life. No. Release them. Let them go. Let them do what God wants them to do. All right? So everyone has this invitation. One invitation can change a person's life forever. And uh, I want to encourage each one of us. Right? I know that we are students right now, but when we go back to our hometowns for the break, uh, do this. Try it out. Just one person invite. You never know, uh, you know who you're inviting, and you never know the impact that person can do for the body of Christ. Amen? Man. All right, let's uh, stop now. I'll meet you next class. Thank you. Thank you to those who are online as well. Thank you.